We have a guest today, Kelly Curry, who's a senior fellow with the Project 2049 Institute. It's a think tank here in Washington. Yes, believe it or not, some people do actually think in this town. Kelly, thanks for being with us. Sure, Jerry. Thank you. We have been sort of trying to lay the groundwork of um, this meeting. I think it's today, this afternoon, or maybe tomorrow with the president tomorrow morning. and the Dalai Lama tomorrow morning. You've written a really interesting piece in the Wall Street Journal. Would, do you want to walk us through sort of the scenario of, uh, of this meeting and why this is different than the meetings in the past uh, years with the United States President and the Dalai Lama? Sure. Um, what's different is that President Obama came into office with a goal of trying to um, build a relationship with China based on, I think you can say, appeasement. Um, certainly an over-solicitousness of their sensitivities. And Tibet is a very sensitive issue for the Chinese. They're quite neuralgic about it. And so he was um, – he should have met with the Dalai Lama back in October of last year when the Dalai Lama was in town on a long scheduled visit. And there was every expectation that that was going to happen. But then over the summer, the White House decided – that it would be too upsetting to the Chinese to go forward with that meeting because Obama was planning to go to Beijing in November. And they um, basically said they were going to postpone the meeting. And it was the first time in over a decade that a sitting president in the, in the, of the United States had failed to meet with the Dalai Lama when he was in Washington. And it set a poor precedent, and it was kind of a part and parcel of a record of steps that the Obama administration took last year, thinking that they could charm their way to get the Chinese to cooperate on a number of different issues, both domestic and international, by, um, by placating them on, on things like human rights and Tibet. For people who... Um Kelly Fred Thompson, thank you for being with us. Uh, for people who don't know the background here, just briefly um, tell the folks what the relationship is uh, between China and the people of Tibet and the, and, the, and the brief history of how we got to where we are and why this is important. Oh, gosh, that's a big question. <laughs> that's a brief, <laughs> that's that's a, my dad. Sound kind of crazy, um, doesn't it? I'm sorry. <laughs> that's great. That's fine. Um, well, I'll give you the recent history, which is that in 1949, um, the People's Republic of China was formed, and shortly thereafter, the People's Liberation Army moved into Tibet. And prior to that time, there had been a complicated relationship. You know, the nation-state system in Asia was still a pretty loose concept prior in, prior to the 20th century. They and, came in um, and took them over and divided them up, didn't they? Well, they took over they took over the whole Tibetan plateau through force. Um, tried to co-opt the Dalai Lama. That lasted for about um, eight or nine years. And ultimately, through their what they called their democratic reforms, which was really the institution of um, communism, collectivization, and um, banning of religion, and all of these other practices that the communists brought in with them in their, quote, peaceful liberation of Tibet, um, they they alienated the Tibetan people so greatly and, and pushed the Dalai Lama to the point where he could no longer stay there. And he feared for his life, actually, and fled to India into exile in 1959 and has been there ever since. The Chinese um, have been br brutal to them. The, the, the Chinese occupation of Tibet has been quite brutal. Um, it has been based on um, both the use of force, security, um, a heavy security presence, but also a real economic colonialism that the Chinese practice, taking extractive industries and, and, and taking resources out of Tibet, sending settlers into Tibet. It's been a real colonial approach. Has, has this administration said anything that would be pro-Tibet, uh, as other Democrats and Republicans have done? They've actually said very little. Um, what they have said has been, um, I think, an attempt to be very even-handed, which um, in a situation where you have a, you know, the world, the, the largest standing army in the world, the People's Republic Army, or the People's Liberation Army bearing down on the Tibetan people and um, six million Tibetans struggling to preserve their culture and their, their, their lives, basically, 
it's not really a fair fight, and to take kind of an even-handed approach in that situation is is almost as bad as saying nothing. So most of what they said has been, oh, we hope the two sides will, will work out their gr- their grievances or things like that that are not really very helpful in this situation. Do you think this meeting uh, that the president's having with the Dalai Lama now tomorrow is uh – what do you think it means? Is is the president taking cognizance, really, of what's going on there and the brutal suppression of those people? Or is he simply responding to the criticism he got last time by not seeing the Dalai Lama? Well, I think that there are a couple possibilities. One is there has been a lot of criticism of the president's China policy as having, been, as having gone too far towards appeasement and getting no results in Copenhagen with Iran, with um, very with the currency issue with China, there are all of these quote important issues, and they are important issues that we engage with the Chinese on. Um, but they have gotten no traction with the Chinese on these issues by playing nice with them. And so I think in the past six weeks, two months, you've seen a real shift in the tone from the White House on China. They are taking a tougher tone. Um, they did schedule this meeting with the Dalai Lama. They did the arms sales package to Taiwan, which is another big provocation for the Chinese in their terminology. And mm-hmm. so they've done some things, but the question is whether this is just tactical, if the White House feels like, oh, we need to look tougher on China, or whether they are really reevaluating the kind of underpinnings of their China policy and looking at whether they made a mistake in believing that there was this ground to build this kind of cooperation operative partnership that they believed that they could build with China. Well, you know, it, it seems like the Chinese are un, uncharacteristically are kind of succumbing to uh, international opinion by, by beginning to meet with the Dalai Lama themselves and uh, long drawn out discussions and so forth. I don't know if anything is, will ever come out of it. Probably not. But at least they're doing that now, aren't they? They are, and I think that you know you have to you have to look very closely to see the changes in their position and their posture. And sometimes they're good, and sometimes they're bad. But um, lately, they have um, they've made some they made some at least cosmetic changes to their policies in Tibet recently that seem to be responsive to some of the concerns that the Dalai Lama has raised and that have come up in these talks that you referenced that have been going on since two thousand two, um, and. I think that they're, they are sensitive to international pressure. This remains an issue that keeps them out of um, the mainstream. It, it keeps them from being a fully respected, fully normal country, if you will. And so it does. they are sensitive to pressure on it. Well, let's, uh, let's, let's hope that uh, this White House will uh, take advantage of that situation and, uh, and, and take a step up for these people. Thank you for being with us today. Very You're enlightening. Welcome, Senator. Well, I appreciate it.